Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Portland City Council Candidate Forum. My name is Amy Boyce, and I'm a volunteer with the Portland Area League of Women Voters. Tonight, we'll be speaking with Regina Phillips and Nathaniel Ferguson. Regina and Nathaniel are running for one council opening in District 3. Welcome and thank you for your willingness to serve and to participate in tonight's forum. For those of you unfamiliar with the League of Women Voters, here is a brief summary of our mission. The League of Women Voters is a political, grassroots, network, and membership organization that believes the freedom to vote is a nonpartisan issue. For more than a century, the League has worked to empower voters and defend democracy. As a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, the League does not support or oppose candidates or political parties. Increased partisanship in this, country's, in this country makes the League of Women Voters nonpartisan candidate forums for local offices ever more important. In line with the League's principles, our goals tonight are to address each other with respect, to inform voters, and to encourage participation in the upcoming election. We invite you to learn more about the League at lwv.org. In an effort to remain fully transparent, I'd like to let voters know that the League invited the three City Council candidates running for the contested at-large seat to participate in tonight's forum. However, two of the candidates declined. It is the League's policy that at least two candidates participate for one competitive seat, so we were unable to include the at-large candidate in tonight's forum. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening's forum, Sue Robbins. Sue is an instructional designer currently living on Munjoy Hill. Sue has moderated a variety of forums, including the 2019 League of Women Voters Mayoral Candidates Forum and developed moderator training for the League of Women Voters. Sue's background includes development of training and online learning experiences for corporate, higher education, and government clients teaching and teacher coaching in higher education and grades K through 12, and service as an elected member of a, board, of a school board in another city. Sue holds a BS in zoology, an MS in education, and a certificate in e-learning instructional design. Welcome, Sue. Thank you, Amy. Welcome, candidates and to all in the audience. Thank you to all that are here tonight and all who are viewing online for your participation in our electoral process. Municipal elections are critical to the direction and prospects for our city. Before we begin, I'll briefly explain the format for this evening. Each candidate will have three minutes to introduce themselves in their opening statements. Each candidate will then be asked to respond to seven questions written by the League of Women Voters. The order of the questioning will alternate between the candidates, and each response will be limited to two minutes. So that you may know how much time you have for each question, a timekeeper will hold up a yellow card to indicate you have 30 seconds, and a red card to indicate that your time is finished. We would like to end the evening with 15 minutes of audience questions. Interested audience members will be provided a note card on which they can write their questions. I will, read the candidate, I will read the questions, and each candidate will have two minutes to respond. There will likely be time for three to four questions. Following questions, you will each have two minutes to make a closing statement. The format of this forum is moderated question and answer. As such, there will be no debate on any issue, but rather an expression of each candidate's opinion. Therefore, I ask each candidate not to challenge, accuse, or state positions of the other candidate in their responses, as there will be not a, no opportunity to respond. Audience members, I ask you to please hold your comments and applause until the end of the event. This both saves time and ensures that all can hear. Before we began, we tossed a coin, and Nathaniel chose to take the first question, meaning that Regina will be the first to do her three-minute introduction. Let's begin with the opening statements. Regina, you may have three minutes. Thank you. First of all, I just want to thank the League um, of Women Voters for having us here this evening. Um, and, and it's an honor to be here, especially here with my opponent. Um, I, um, I'm a ninth generation Mainer. I grew up in Maine. I grew up in Portland. Um, I've been a resident here for about 60 years. Um, I'm a mother of three. 
uh, and I have two grandchildren. Um, educationally, I have a master's in social work and a doctorate in uh, social work from Tulane University. So my whole professional career, I've been a social worker. I've tried to take care of families, um, advocating for them and bringing people together um, to achieve a positive and sustainable change. I started out, I've worked at Head Start Center, um, I worked at the uh, Homeless Teen cent uh, Shelter, um, and for 19 years I actually worked for the City of Portland. Um, at first I was at the Family Shelter, running the Family Shelter, um, and then after that I was there for seven years, and then after that I moved over and I ran the Refugee Services Program. Um, the Refugee Services Program unfortunately closed in 2016, in spring of 2016, because we lost a big federal grant worth $1.1 million. Um, and from there, I went to uh, the Westbrook School Department, and I worked there for five years. When I worked at the Westbrook School Department, I was hired to be their Grants and Community Engagement Coordinator, um, and then over time, I uh, switched jobs to be the Equity Resource Coordinator. Um, I've served on, um, right, currently right now, I, uh, I co-founded my own organization called Cross-Cultural Community Services. I co-founded it with two of my friends and colleagues, um, and we do work, uh, we do cultural competency and equity, diversity, and inclusion work. Um, I've sat on many boards. Um, I've sat on the Coastal Enterprise Inc. Board and the United Way of Greater Portland, which is now uh, United Way of Southern Maine. Um, I sat on their boards um, both for two terms, which was about six years. Um, <clears throat> I've had the opportunity to work with many leaders across the state. Um, both professionally and personally. Um, and um, I have also um, served on countless committees looking at a variety of issues, um, 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 juvenile justice, um, homelessness, social justice, um, all of those things. And so um, I w I'm running because I, have the, I feel like I have the expertise um, and I have the experience um, to um, bring people together. Um, and um, try to, uh, oops, oh, I wasn't supposed to do that, was I? Sorry. No, go ahead, you have 30 um, seconds. <laughs> and um, so um, I'm just running um, because I do think at this point, we have a really good city council and I think we have the opportunity um, to, get some, to get things done. Thank you, Regina. You're welcome. Nathaniel, you have three, three minutes. Great, thank you. And thanks to the League of Women Voters for organizing this. Um, it's great to be here. Um, talking with you all today. Um, so, hi, I'm Nathaniel Ferguson. I'm 23 years old. Um, I lived all over Maine, and I currently rent half of a lovely duplex in the Oakdale neighborhood. I grew up in Limerick, and I went to high school in Aroostook County at the main school of science and math, or MSSM. Uh, from there, I studied math and statistics at Colby College in Wanderville and received my bachelor's of arts from them, and now I work as a data analyst in a Portland nonprofit. Growing up, Portland was always an ex the exciting big city that I would visit with, with my family. When I was looking for a place to live after college, I didn't want to leave Maine, but I wanted to live somewhere with lots of people to meet and things to do, and Portland was the obvious choice. I was extremely fortunate to find a job that uses my math background and pays me enough to afford this city. Now I'm very proud and grateful to call Portland my home. There are so many different political issues in Portland, in Maine, and in America. Some are issues that really need to be tackled at the national and state level, like immigration policy and healthcare. But there are many issues that deeply affect us on the local level, which get left out of the partisan din, like how we build our city and what we value as a community. I'm running for city council because I think there's a desperate need for city council to address the biggest issues facing Portland, including housing affordability, transportation access, and environmental justice. If elected as your District 3 Counselor, I'm not going to ask politely for a study to consider the potential impacts of the city maybe doing something. I'm going to actually do something. I'm going to put forward policies that move our city in the right direction, and I'm going to work hard to make Portland more affordable, livable, and inclusive. I think it's fair to say that the City Council has earned a reputation for not addressing the issues that are most important to the people of Portland. It's clear from the number of referendums that have been put to voters in, past, in the past few years that the people of Portland are unhappy with the inaction of city council. Whether you agree with the referendums or not, I think it would be foolish to dismiss that message from voters. I intend on introducing policies that address these issues and embracing the public comment and amendment process to land on policy that actually works. No city can stay the same forever. The question for Portland is what direction do we want to change in? Do we want to be a city where rising costs of living displace our working class, 
prevent families from living close to where they work, and ensure that only the well-off can enjoy life here? Or do we want to be a city that welcomes new residents with open arms, supports the hardworking people that make Portland run, and embraces diversity, community, and solidarity as its biggest strengths? I believe the answer is clear, and I hope that you hear what we have to say tonight and agree with my vision. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, <laughs> you also chose to take the yeah. first question. So, question one, as a council member, how would you work to increase civic engagement between Portland residents and City Hall? I think that civic engagement is a very important part of making the city run, but I also think that we need to be realistic about the burdens that attending city meetings, uh, going to events, and keeping up with city politics place on working people, young people, and people who might not be as plugged in to the day-to-day -day minutia of the city. I think that as a city councilor, I would aim to have the city make sure that residents are getting information that's relevant to them at, at a time when they need it and at a time when their action is required. I don't think that, um, I, I think that we need to be honest that if we just say, well, there is public comment on it, if you had been reading every city council agenda, you could have shown up and spoke. I think we need to be realistic about the fact that the people who have time to show up to every meeting, to say everything, tend to be of a different demographic than people who don't have the time for that, for people who are working, for people who um, they, they don't have the time or the energy or the money to, to attend those meetings. So I think that really it starts with the city directly reaching out to voters. And I think that it's about making sure that the information they're given is relevant and actionable. So that's meeting voters where they are with surveys, um, with social media. We can't, we can't just say, yeah, voters, you come to us. We need to, if, if we want to hear from the people who live here, we need to go out and meet them. Thanks. Thank you, Nathaniel. I'll repeat the question just to make sure it, it's, it's to, to, be sure, to be fair. So, Regina, as a council member, how would you work to increase civic engagement between Portland residents and City Hall? I think we have to look at this um, in two folds. One is the internal uh, civic engagement uh, or engagement, and the other one is an, um, an external. And so internally, I think that um, we need to look at the annual neighborhood meetings. Um, we have them once a year. Maybe what we need to do regarding civ civic engagement is to hold them twice a year. Um, so that, um, f that uh, we're going externally out into those neighborhoods and listening to what people have to say. Um, a lot of folks can't get to City Hall. A lot of folks don't want to come to City Hall. And so therefore, I think we need to go out into those neighborhoods and we need to talk to those folks. And we need to continually get their voice because a lot of people in those neighborhoods, has not, they have not had a voice. And so that's one option is to go out um, it, to have uh, more of the annual um, neighborhood meetings. I think we need to look at the boards and the commissions. Um, the city has a lot of boards and commissions, and we need to constantly take a look at those and see if those boards and commissions are what the city is looking for. You know, we just recently did a racial inequity task, we had a task force, and they made some recommendations, and those recommendations were how we were going to engage with the communities, especially those communities of color that typically do not think they have a voice. And so I think we need to take a look at that plan. I think we need to look at the recommendations so that we're making sure that everybody in the city is heard because previously, I'm not sure if that was the actual case. Um, I think we need to host more events. Uh, when I worked in Westbrook, the police chief, Janine Roberts, at the time, she did an open house. And so I think that we need to, to open that up um, and look and see if there are events uh, that we can do to bring people into City Hall, those um, who were not used to going into City Hall. Um, and so I think, again, it takes an external and internal plan um, in order for us to continually engage. Thank you. Question two. This goes to you, Regina. <laughs> the lack of affordable housing in Portland is a topic of great concern to many voters. What measures would you support to increase the supply of affordable housing for those seeking to work and live here in Portland? Well, uh, first of all, I think that um, I think we have to look at um, who has been working and doing um, affordable housing. Um, Cullen Ryan at Community Housing in Maine has done an incredible amount of work uh, to look at affordable housing in, in Portland. Um, and so um, currently, um, Community Housing in Maine is building a, um, a 90 plus units, affordable housing units at the old Mercy Hospital uh, building. And those units are gonna be affordable and it's not just gonna be um, you know, it's going to be for everybody, um, young, old, <coughs> you name it. 
There's other buildings that are coming up, uh, other, other affordable units that are coming up in the city as well. Um, there's the, um, uh, the uh, Wessex Woods, um, I mean, there's the um, Phoenix Flag, which is Phoenix Flats, which is the building that's going to be going out on Middle Street. That's also some affordable housing units. Um, Wessex Woods uh, is another affordable housing unit that is on Bright Nav, that's in my district or our district. Um, and so there are a lot of people looking at affordable housing. Homelessness and housing is not just, it's not just, a, it wasn't just a pandemic issue. It's been, a, it's been an ongoing issue. And so I think we need to applaud the people that have actually been doing that work. That said, there's still a ton of things that still need to be done. We still need more affordable housing units. And I think that um, we need to look at, you know, our, uh, the quarters. I mean, like I say, we have an affordable housing unit on Brighton Avenue. Um, and I think we need to look at, I think we need to, I think we need to look at, you know, Forest Ave, Brighton Ave, Washington Ave, places where we think that we can, um, um, you know, build some buildings that uh, will look, looks at affordable housing. Um, and so we also have to remove the barriers um, uh, for people um, accessing housing and affordable housing. Um, you know, background checks, um, you know, credit checks and all of those things so that people can actually afford um, the house that they're living in and have the option of living in them permanently. Thank you. Nathaniel, the lack of affordable housing in Portland is a topic of great concern to many voters. What measures would you support to increase the supply of affordable housing for those seeking to work and live here in Portland? So affordable housing is one of my biggest concerns uh, as, a, as, as, as a candidate and as a person who lives in Portland. Uh, I think that the core issue behind housing being unaffordable in Portland is that we simply don't have enough housing. We are drastically undersupplied. Estimates put us at around 10,000 units short from Portland and South Portland combined for what we would need to have like a truly sustainable number of units. And the reason for that is because our land use policies make it illegal to build anything more dense than single family homes throughout much of the, throughout much of the city. Uh, the duplex that I live in, for example, was built in 1920 before the introduction of zoning. And it could not be built today. The lot it's on is 5,000 some odd square feet, and it needs to be at least 6,000 square feet to allow a duplex. Um, it's also too close to the sides, so the side setbacks need to be changed. There's a lot of barriers to building middle density housing that can actually fit people, and we can do it in a way that folds into our existing neighborhoods. The, the uh, recode, which is a process looking at the land use code that's going on right now, they, they did some initial estimates, and it seems like a lot of the older neighborhoods have much of the housing that is there is not currently legal under the existing zoning laws. And so I think that at a bare minimum, we need to make it possible to build the stuff that we already have on new land. But we also need to be looking at making it possible for those middle-sized developments to be, to be legal. Uh, currently, there's no distinction in the land use code between a three-unit building and a 30-unit building. And I think that makes no sense. Um, we need to make it possible to build enough housing so that we have enough physical space for people to live, and that'll get the price down for everyone, not just, not just the people who can luck into a subsidized unit, not just for the people who are connected enough to get access to those resources, but if we truly bring down the price of housing across the board, I think that does wonders for our city. Thank you. Nathaniel, question three. Under the One Climate Future Plan, the City of Portland has collaborated, collaborated with the City of South Portland to reduce community-wide greenhouse gases and prepare for a variety of negative impacts caused by global climate change. What measures, either from the plan or in addition to it, would you support to reduce the effects of climate change on public health, safety, and economic security here in Portland? Right, so there are two, there are two big issues. So the One Climate Future Plan, if you haven't read it, has about five different policy recommendation areas that it focuses on. There's two that I want to highlight in particular, and that's um, rethinking how we use land, our land use and housing policies, but then also transportation. Um, and so a big thing for me is that I think that we should be, as recommended by the plan, we should be looking at our streets and making sure that our streets are safe and accessible for people not inside a car. So if people are biking, if people are walking, that active transportation both re reduces our emissions because those people aren't driving, it makes it more pleasant for the people who do end up driving, and it may leads to a healthier, safer community. 
Same with, um, same with having denser, denser neighborhoods where people can live and they're within walking distance of places to go. That means that they don't need to be getting in a car to go get groceries. They don't need to be doing all these, all these things. And that, that can really help us live in a more sustainable way. Uh, there is no, no form of housing is more expensive and harmful for the environment than the sort of single family sprawl where we have lots of roads that are all spread out and you need to drive between everything. And so I think that by allowing, um, you know, sort of smart density in Portland, I think that we can start moving in that more sustainable direction as pitched in the one climate future. And that's really what we need to do if we want to get, if we want to be serious about meet, meeting our emissions goals that are, that are in the, that plan. We need to be investing in the bus system. We need to be investing in pedestrian infrastructure. And we need to be investing in making it possible to get around the city without needing a big car. Thank you. Regina, what measures, either from the One Climate Future Plan or in addition to it, would you support to reduce the effects of climate change on public health, safety, and the economic security here in Portland? Yeah, I mean, the, um, the One Climate Future Plan, it's 300 pages. Um, and in it, um, it talks about uh, there, there, uh, there are four goals, right? And those goals, you know, talk about um, waste and uh, transportation and land use um, and uh, climate um, change. And it, it, it's, it's a very, very thorough plan. And under those goals are strategies um, that South Portland and Portland put together. Um, and um, I think it's a really good plan. I think that we need to continually take a look at the plan and see um, what in there are our priorities because you can't take a look at all of those things in that plan and go We're going to tackle every single one of them. It's just too overwhelming I think we need to tr I think we need to support Troy Moon who um, runs the office of sustainability at the at the city I think we need to support him um, he can't do it all on his own. He's only got one staff member, so he can't do it all on his own. So I'd like to give him another staff, another staff person um, in order for us to really take a look at what is in the plan and how we can move that plan forward. The other thing is, is the other thing that I would do is Portland and South Portland actually have a really good relationship. And so we have to give, we have to give credit where credit is due. They put this plan together. Um, and they, to me, they've thought of everything, everything that we could possibly change. Is there more that we can do? obvious probably um, and so we need to support the plan and we need to make sure that Portland and the city of Portland and the city of South Portland are continually talking they're continually looking at, at each other and having conversations about the plan so that we can actually um, uh, cross off our goals continually take a look at our goals and our strategies so that we can um, so that we can develop more more goals thank you yeah. question four is for you Regina Social support services for immigrants and asylum seekers arriving here in Portland are stretched to the limit. What actions would you take to address this issue? Yeah, this is uh, this is in my real house because when I worked for the city of Portland, I ran the refugee services program. Um, and even though it closed in 2016, uh, my work uh, within those communities have um, have continued. Um, and so um, I think we need to give some credit to the city of Portland. I think Chelsea Hoskins, who is the refugee coordinator, I think she's doing a really, really good job of trying to take care of so many families um, and not just the refugee and immigrant uh, families. Um, I think she's doing a fabulous job. Um, and I also think the community-based organizations are doing a great job. We have folks going out there, Gateway Community College, Hope House. We have folks going out there that are constantly looking at those families to make sure that they're getting the resources that they need. And so the major thing with the families, the refugee and immigrant families right now, is housing. And housing is a huge issue. Um, and so we need to continually look at that. They need to continue to work uh, with their case managers um, and uh, their, their communities um, in order to get housing. And we know housing is an issue. Um, and we've already talked about affordable housing, um, so we don't need to go down that road anymore. But I think the other thing that we need to look at, we need to look at um, making sure that our refugee and immigrant can, uh, uh, community can work. Um, and one of the federal stipulations is, is it's going to take you a year to get a work permit. Uh, a lot of folks come over here and they want to work and they want to work now. Um, and so we need to take a look at that. Um, and we also um, uh, have to look at um, you know, uh, other things that they may need regarding health care and taking care of their children and also looking at our systems. The, most of the m members that I know, because I've worked with a lot of community members within the refugee and immigrant community, and they just want to understand the systems, 
right? They want to they want to understand the education system, and so I think we need to continually talk to them and continue to outreach to them and continually case manage them um, so that they can be successful um, in our community. Thank you. Nathaniel, social support services for immigrants and asylum seekers arriving here in Portland are stretched to the limit. What actions would you take to address this issue? Yeah, so I think that uh, asylum seekers and refugees are a big asset that Portland has. I think that they represent, as we all know, Maine is the oldest state in the nation and we're getting older. And it's only through um, immigration that we can have the next generation of Mainers and Portlanders and people who are here to live and work. Um, unfortunately, as, um, as was pointed out, the federal law does bar um, asylum seekers from working for a, a while after they arrive in the U.S. And unfortunately, uh, Portland City Council does not set federal immigration policy. Um, so there's not much that we can do about that. What we can do is we can look at how are we supporting these people in the time between when they arrive here and when they're eligible to work and when they can start supporting themselves. And I think that's really important. I think that we need to be honest about the fact that it's expensive and we need to be talking to the state government and the federal government saying, hey, we, we, need, to, we, we need money to, to take care of these people. We need to make sure that they're connected with services. And we need to continue working with our partners that already do fantastic work working with these families. Um, you know, it currently does cost $12,000 a month for us to host a family in a South Portland hotel. And I think that if we tackle the housing issue, we can get that price down if we start having more locations for them to be. And I also think that we just need to be, we, we need to be viewing asylum seekers and refugees and all these new Mainers as an investment in our future. Uh, I, I really think that they, they pay off in the end and it's only it, the diversity of Portland and the new people arriving in Portland is our biggest strength. And so I think we need to, we need to be emphasizing that. We need to make sure that Portland remains a welcoming and safe place for everyone. Thank you. Next question goes to you first, Nathaniel. According to Preble Street, there are an estimated 1,500 unhoused individuals currently seeking shelter here in Portland. This number has nearly doubled since the beginning of the pandemic. As a council member, what steps would you take to address homelessness in Portland? Yeah, so homelessness is a, is, is a problem, and it's a problem that has a um, sort of a dangerously simple solution, right? If, if people have homes or, and they're housed, they're, they're no longer homeless. So in the long run, the fix is we have more housing available so that these people can have a safe, warm place they can call home. Uh, in the short term, though, like, we're not going to be able to fix that overnight. So in the short term, we need to make sure that people are connected with the services they need, whether that's the uh, temporary shelter that, so they can get back on their feet, whether that's a more permanent supportive housing model, or whether that's something like the new Preble Street um, shelter that's opening up that has um, some support services in place for them with the, uh, to help them through any mental health issues or, or dr drug addiction that their people are struggling with. So I think that really we need to take an all of the above approach. I think I, I really support the housing first model of getting people into homes so that they're warm, they're safe, they don't need to worry about how they're getting food um, and whether they'll have a warm place to sleep. I think that really we need to make sure that nobody's sleeping out on the streets in the cold. We need to make sure that people aren't just left, um, you know, le left with no other options. I, I think that if we, if we don't do that, then we're kind of failing as a city. And I think that you know, we also need to be honest with the state again about the fact that Portland ends up taking on a lot of homeless people that other, um, that other municipalities don't want to deal with. And so we need to, you know, say this is a regional problem and we need to work with other uh, municipalities. We need to work with the state to make sure that we have the resources to make sure that these people are safe. Thank you. Regina, as a council member, what steps would you take to address homelessness in Portland? Well, I think we need to look at um, who has been providing services to the homeless population and who's been doing this work for a long time. 
like Nathaniel said, uh, Preble Street just opened up a 40-bed shelter, um, and that will get some folks um, uh, into a safe place um, uh, um, every single day, and that's exactly what we want. Um, I think we're building a shelter, out, a, a, a big 200-person um, 200, 200 shelter um, out, on, uh, out in the Riverside area. Um, that's supposed to be opening up in the spring. I think that will bring down the, the um, number of homelessness. I also think that we need to look at Shelter Plus Care. We need to look at the BRAP program, the Bridging Rental Assistance Program. We need to increase those, those um, programs so that folks um, can get the subsidy they need to live permanently um, in housing. I think that Nathaniel also mentioned housing, the Housing First model. Um, I think we need more, of, uh, uh, we need to look at that model um, as well. Um, at tr 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 transitional housing and project-based housing. Those are all really good examples of housing that we could do, and that is happening now that we can get people in. You know, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that I've been involved in um, is the Emergency Shelter Assessment Committee, and that is something that a lot of folks around the table come together to try to figure out how we can deal with the homeless population um, and what steps that we need to do to make sure that we're taking care of folks in a respectful manner. And so th they are constantly looking at that, not only that for folks who are homeless, but also those folks that have been homeless um, for you know, several years, uh, the long-term stayers. Um, I think we need to look at our general assistance guidelines. I know that those are state guidelines, but in the city of Portland, we, we can do something with um, the maximums, and we can also take a look and see what we can do. Um, and thinking about general assistance and thinking about this in general, we also definitely need to always consider partnering with the state because um, even though we're a municipality, there are a lot of things that we can do on the state level. Um, and taking a look at general assistance um, is another one that I think that we can do. Thank you. Yeah. Question six, Regina. A major role of the city council is to adopt an annual budget for both municipal and school operations. Do you support the Charter Commission's recommendations regarding budget autonomy for the school board? Please explain your position. Yeah, education is really close to my home. Um, I, I raised my three kids in, in Portland. Um, I have a grandson who goes to Talbot Community School. Um, when I was a member of the NAACP um, for a couple of years, I chaired the education uh, committee. And so I've had the opportunity of working with a lot of folks at the Portland Public Schools. I've also had a chance to look at um, some, of the, some of the policies. Um, you know, I remember going to a, a school board meeting um, and asking them why brown and black kids weren't referred to um, AP classes. Um, and obviously since then that has changed. And so education is a big one for me. And so, um, I, you know, I think that um, the, schools, the schools have plenty um, to, uh, to deal with and they have, they're in charge of their own policies and their own procedures. Um, and I think the budget is one of those. And I think it's very difficult, um, you know, to try um, to put a budget together. I worked at the Westbrook School Department and so I was part of those conversations. When you're looking at something and you're saying, we need to cut that and you're like, well, wait a minute, how can we cut that? Because we need to make sure that all of our children are succeeding. Um, and so um, I want to do some more research as far as that question is concerned. Um, at, at this point, I think that, um, you know, I think that, that there's enough for the city um, to tackle and to take a look at um, a across the board with everything that we have going on. Um, and I think we need to continue to work with the school department to make sure um, that our kids are, are graduating and being successful. Thank you. Nathaniel, do you support the Charter Commission's recommendations regarding budget autonomy for the school board? And please explain your position. Yeah. Um I think I think it's it's a good question. I, I don't support the, uh, the the proposal from the Charter Commission, and that's because I think that the current model for how we approve the school budget uh, works really well. So, for those who don't know, currently the school board sets a budget, and then it gets approved by the school board, and then it gets sent to City Council. City Council can ask questions about it, but they ultimately vote on it. If they want to give the school board less than the total amount of money they asked for, they need a supermajority in order to do so. Um, and then otherwise, it gets folded into the city budget and it's all part of your uh, property tax package. Uh, the reason why I don't think that the, why I don't support the proposal for the school budget autonomy is because I think that the school board should focus on running the school. If they should focus on the, uh, the policies, they should focus on the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, the school board is really about making sure that kids are educated and I think that's why we should be picking people for school board, and I think that's what the school board should focus on. I don't want to see the school board being a place where people 
where the school board is raising taxes, essentially. Um, I think that what we would see under the uh, proposal would be candidates running for school board, and their platform could be, I'm going to get on the school board, and then I'm going to just make your property taxes go down. And I don't think that's really what we want um, for the school board. I think the school board should be about, here's what we need for the schools, and then I think the city council should look at the budget altogether and should say, all right, this is the budget, this is how much we're doing for property taxes, here's how we're going to fund the different parts of our city. Thank you. And last question that you were warned about <laughs> is question seven, and Nathaniel, you go first. Please share with us an issue specific to District 3 that you see as a high priority for you as a member of the City Council. Right, so an issue, uh, an issue that I think is a big priority for District 3 um, would be allowing for more mixed-use um, areas in District 3. So District 3 is kind of strange, you know, we're off, we're off Peninsula, it's a little bit too far to walk onto the peninsula a lot of the time. Um, and we have all these uh, commercial areas, but they're big strip malls. It can be kind of unpleasant to walk around them. And it can make it hard if you just want a few things of, for groceries, if you um, just kind of want to walk around the neighborhood. There, you kind of have this big segregation between residential areas and commercial areas. So what I'd like to see is I'd like to see us open up uh, the ability for small businesses, um, little corner stores throughout the district so that everyone's within uh, just a short, you can walk around the corner, you can stop and pick up some items for dinner, you know, and you can really build community in that way. And that also has the benefit of building these more sustainable and dense communities that we were talking about earlier. So th that's something that I'd like to see in District 3 and I think that allowing for more of that sort of mixed use development where you have maybe uh, a little shop and then an apartment on top, that, um, that is, I think, something that District 3 in particular could stand to benefit from a lot. Because currently, we're, if you look at just even the, the land use zoning maps, it's very carved up between this is the area for the staples and the, um, and, and the shopping center, and this is the area where people live in their homes. And I think that if we can integrate that a little bit more, we'll have a much more bustling, we'll have a much richer community and urban space for people to live in. Thank you. Regina, please share with us an issue specific to District 3 that you see as a high priority. Yeah, I think District 3 um, is, is unique, just like uh, you know, some, of the other, some of the other districts in, in Portland. I mean, we've got, we've got coffee shops, we've got restaurants, we've got apartment buildings, we have home ownerships. Um, it's got, uh, District 3 has a lot to offer, and so I, I do think we should take a look um, at that area, like I said earlier, um, and look at um, what affordable housing that we can um, that we can build out in um, in District Three, um, and not only affordable housing but workforce workforce units. Um, it's a really good place to to be because it has that mixture. Um, and so I do think that we can take a look at that and see. Um, and again, Wessex Woods is a really good example of how something was able to be built right then and there. It's on the bus line. Uh, so it is looking at, um, you know, our emissions and all of that. And so I do think that it gets, uh, like my opponent said, it gets those things off of the peninsula um, and gets people um, out there. And we don't, and they don't, because it's on the bus line, um, Bright Nav and everything, um, it, it wouldn't be a bad walk to, um, to um, get on the bus and then come in town if, if somebody uh, needed to work there. I, I think there, there are some small, um, really nice uh, shops there. I think we need to have conversations with them. I think we need to figure out how we can how we can um, make them stay in those neighborhoods. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of times there's restaurants that was closing, um, and these restaurants have been there for a really, really long time. I, and so I think we need to find out how we can help and what we can do in order to make sure that they can sustain their building um, and, their, um, and their business. Thank you. Thank you both for your thoughtful answers to those seven questions. I hope we have some questions from the audience. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. So Regina, this will go to you first. Okay. okay. First question is, and this is a two-minute answer. Uh, give a specific example of how you have worked with others with opposing views to gain consensus. Uh, a specific example of when I've worked with folks on a post. God, there's been so many. Um, Let's see. Um, 
uh, I would say, um, let's see. Well, I think that um, I think one of the opposing views is how we um, tackle equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and so I think that, uh, like I say earlier, that the city has put together a racial they put together a racial equity task force, and they've made recommendations on how we can um, continue to get along with, uh, to continue to engage folks, um, what our schools will look like, um, and what our city needs to look like, and hiring. Diverse can racially diverse candidates and all those other things. There are some people that believe that we're we're right where we need to be, um, and that we don't need to look at race. Um, that we've come a long way, um, and that um, you know things are going um, as smoothly and, and within time. Um, those things will get worked out. Thank you, and Nathaniel, give a specific example of how you have worked with others with opposing views to gain consensus. Yeah, so I think that a place where I've, I've worked with other people and I've talked with them about um, people who might disagree with me strongly, but we, we end up reaching a consensus is on the issues of, um, you know, of, of land use policy and affordable housing creation. I think that um, when I go and talk to people about, um, you know, whether they're conservative or they're, you know, libertarian or they're a, a socialist, that when, when we sit down and we start to look at what do we want to see in a city? What do we want to see from the, what, what do we want to see in what's allowed? Um, it turns out that people, I think, al almost always have the same view in mind. You know, they want to see a city where people can live, where people can feel safe, and where people can, can be authentically in their communities. And um, so I think that really on a lot of those issues that, that we see at the city level in, in particular, there's there's a lot of common ground because the, it turns out that you know the major political parties and most people's political identities don't really map cleanly onto uh, you know issues of like land use and zoning regulation. It just isn't really something that's talked about. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of common ground there to be found. And I think that you know when you when you work with people, you find that there there is a lot of room for compromise here, and it's, it can move our city in the right direction. Thank you. And Nathaniel, would you consider holding council meetings at remote locations, such as schools, maybe one meeting in each district each year? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great idea. I, I, think that, um, I, I, I think that that would be great for making it easier for people to attend who um, might not be able to make the city hall. I know that uh, you know, City Hall is a lot closer to people who live in District 1 over here than for people who might live out in District 3 near Westbrook. Um, it can be a bit of a drive and you have to find parking and all that. So I think it would be great to get uh, the City Council out in the community and make it easier for people to attend. Um, and I just, yeah, I really don't see any, any downside to that, to that idea. It, 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 gets, it gets people involved. It gets people active, and hopefully it can make it a little bit easier for people to participate. So I think, I think that's a great idea. I think we just have to look and we'd say, make sure that we got the, enough chairs and uh, microphones for everyone. But that's, yeah, I think that's a very thick, solvable problem. Thank you. Regina, would you consider holding council meetings at remote locations? Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I concur with my, my opponent, which is, that's the way to get people involved. When you're talking about engagement, um, that's how you have to do it. You can't just wait for people to show up at City Hall. You have to go where they are. Um, because, like Nathaniel said, because some folks don't have a car. Some folks, uh, you know, have uh, children that then they don't have childcare, and it's easier for them to walk, you know, to their schools. Um, and I think, you know, our, our, we, there's spaces in our schools where, um, you know, we can hold a city council meeting. I think we can also hold just events there to get folks to come and see our schools. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, that, I think that that's the way to go. And I, I also think that we could do neighborhood meetings within our schools as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And Regina, do you favor more bike lanes and better bike infrastructure in Portland? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the only way that we're going to tackle climate change, and one of the ways we're going to tackle climate change, is for us to look at our, our bike routes. And so, um, and the whole and, and transportation and so we we yeah that's what we have to do yeah thank you and Nathaniel do you favor more bike lanes and better bike infrastructure in Portland 
Absolutely. I think that Portland right now, we're sort of going through the growing pains for our bike infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of bike lanes that then don't necessarily connect to things, or then you have to move, merge in with the, the, the cars in the, in the rest of the road. And I think that my, my dream for our, our bike infrastructure is where you can get around on a bike without ever having to interact with a car at speeds above 25 miles an hour. So this means like on, on neighborhood streets, I think you can mix the cars and the bikes, but around areas like Forest Ave, Franklin, uh, Franklin Street, all of these places, I think that we should have physically separated bike infrastructure. Um, and I would love to see us expand not only bike lanes on existing roads, but expand um, our network of mixed use trails and paths um, that we currently have throughout the city. So for example, the Bayside Trail sort of starts like behind Trader Joe's. It's kind of weird and hard to get to, but it actually takes you nice through the Bayside neighborhood. I, I know there's a plan to eventually connect that to Deering Oats, but I'd like to see that continued and, and prioritized. And I'd also like to see more of those sorts of things happen so that it's easy to get around on a bike. It's no longer, you know, it's not a question of, well, can I actually bike? I, it might be technically possible for me to bike there, but I don't really feel safe because of all the, the heavy car traffic or it's kind of getting late, so it might be hard for cars to see me. I want it to just be easy. I want you to be able to hop on your bike and go somewhere if that's, if that's how you want to get around. Thank you. And we have no other questions. Okay. All right. Thank you both for your thoughtful answers. Um, and now... You each get two minutes for a closing statement. And Nathaniel, you went second for, a closing, for opening statement, so you go first for closing statement. And this one is two minutes. Sounds great, yes. So yeah, um, thank you uh, to everyone who's been here today and who's been listening to this, uh, to this event. I just want to leave you with a, with a few thoughts. Uh, I think that Portland needs to, we, again, like I said at the beginning, we need to think about what kind of city we want to become. Do we want to be the city that lets, um, that just tries to hold on to things the way they are and isn't bold, isn't innovative? Or do we want to be this sort of city that really opens up our minds and embraces the change and growth that's necessary to really take us into the 21st century? Um, I think that we need to make sure that per Portland is a city that works for old people, young people, you know, working families, and, and new Mainers. And I think that Portland can get there. And I think that there's a lot that city council can do specifically um, with city council's powers that maybe hasn't been done and hasn't been addressed in a comprehensive way. So if I get elected to city council, I plan to be in there. And I plan to uh, introduce ordinances, um, introduce resolves, and really bring an agenda to city council that then city council can take a look at and vote on. I, I'm not going to just get in there and advocate quietly for some change, maybe ask people if they think it's the right idea. I, I'm going to get in there and I'm, I'm going to put in the work. I'm going I'm to write the, I'm going to write ordinances. I, I'm going to participate emphatically in committees. And I'm going to make sure that the policy of the city is the policy that we need um, going forward because it really, when it comes to the city, all of it stems from the policies and the policy in the city is set by city council. So I'm really more of a policy, not politics kind of guy. I'd love to talk about all sorts of, you know, nitty gritty details on our, uh, you know, city, city policy. And so I hope that that's what you're looking for in your district of candidate. Thank you. And Regina. Your closing statement, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks again for, um, for having us here and um, for the questions uh, and asking the questions. Um, yeah, I, I've lived in Portland my entire life. Um, my roots are here. I have three kids. I, I, my three kids grew up here. I have a grandson that is here. And so I've seen, um, I've seen uh, what, it, what, what has been done. Um, and I can identify what still needs to be done for us to continue to live um, in a vibrant um, and wonderful city. And so I want to, uh, I want to um, be on the city council because I have been around the table and um, with a lot of different people and I think I can bring more people around the table to, to um, figure out what, needs to, what we need to change and what we need to stay the same because I do think we have done 
some really good things within this city um, that, has, uh, that has allowed it to thrive. Um, and so I bring my extensive experience um, and my background of, of bringing people together, a diverse uh, group of people together. Um, so again, so we can look at the city and see what we can celebrate because Portland has a lot to celebrate. We, we're, we are a wonderful city. We have a lot to celebrate, um, even though we know that there are challenges. Um, and so I just want to bring people together because I think we were at a place where um, some of us are not together. And so I have that experience of bringing people together, um, not only locally, but statewide, um, to again, figure out how we can continue to thrive, not only the city of Portland, but statewide, because we also have to work with um, our elected officials across the board, not only within the state, but federally. Thank you. You're welcome. As a member of the League of Women Voters of Portland area, I'd like to thank you for participating in this. And I'd like to thank the audience that's here and the audience that's watching for participating. And I would also ask you, please, to make a plan to vote. Talk to your friends, talk to your relatives, make sure everyone's registered, and make sure everyone gets to the polls. And thank you very much.